Hi, welcome to Mechanical PE Exam Prep Question of the Week, the series where I solve mechanical engineering problems for aspiring professional engineers. In today's video, we're going to calculate the refrigeration load for an air handling unit. Let's get started. Refrigeration load of an air handling unit. An air handling unit with chilled water entering at 50 degrees is shown. The unit serves one room of a factory where product with large moisture release is being produced. Face and bypass control is used to maintain the room at 80 degrees dry bulb and 50% relative humidity. The chilled water coil cools the air leaving the coil to 58 degrees dry bulb, 56 degrees wet bulb. Under all conditions, 20,000 CFM of supply air is delivered to the room and 5,000 CFM of outside air is used for ventilation. The bypass damper is closed at maximum load when the outside air is 90 degrees dry bulb, 74 degrees wet bulb. At the maximum load conditions, what is the total refrigeration load in tons? So first of all, let's talk about why this bypass arrangement would ever be used in the first place. Why not put the entire 20,000 CFM over the coil? The reason is dehumidification. They told us the product being made in the factory has a large moisture release. So there must be something about this setup that allows us to control moisture, and there is. If you put the full volume over the coil and cool it to 58 degrees, that may only be a few degrees lower than the dew point temperature of the entering air. So the amount of moisture removal is limited. However, if you split the air into two streams, it's possible to cool some of the air much more, say to 50 degrees or even colder, which is well below the dew point, driving latent cooling. In other words, causing moisture to condense out of the air at the same time as doing sensible cooling. Then in order to not overcool beyond the desired supplier temperature, which is still 58 degrees, the stream of air having gone over the coil is mixed with the bypass stream, which has not been conditioned. The resulting mixture is the same dry bulb temperature in either case, it's 58 degrees, but the humidity can be driven down much more effectively using the face and bypass strategy. Now I wanted to explain that to you conceptually because it's important, but having said all that, we're interested specifically in the maximum load condition, which happens when the outside air is fairly hot and humid, 90 degrees dry bulb and 74 degrees wet bulb, and they've told us that the bypass damper is closed for max load conditions. This probably means all the air needs to flow over the coil just to make sure the sensible load is being met, and the dew point of the entering air is higher than 58 degrees, such that some latent cooling will happen incidentally, at least enough to satisfy the room from a humidity perspective. Let's see how closing the bypass damper allows us to simplify the problem. So here's the same diagram as in the original problem statement, except I've omitted the bypass damper completely since it's closed and all the air is going over the coil. Therefore, we can simply ignore the bypass. I've also labeled one through four, the outside air in yellow, the return air in green, the mixed air, which enters the coil in red, and the supply air, which leaves the coil in blue. Let's plot each of these points on the psychrometric chart and show the mixing process and the cooling process. State one is the outside air, which we know is 90 degrees dry bulb and 74 degrees wet bulb. If we know any two pieces of information, we can find that point on the psych chart. State two is the return air, and we can take the room conditions as being the same as the return air, assuming the duct is well sealed and insulated. So that's 80 degrees dry bulb and 50% relative humidity. Now state three is a mixture of the outside air and the return air. Since 5,000 CFM of outside air is being introduced, we can assume that approximately 5,000 CFM is being removed by exfiltration because it has to be balanced in the system, right? So that leaves about 15,000 CFM to be recirculated as return air. Now I say approximately because the way the problem statement was written, it says under all conditions, 20,000 CFM is supplied. So the return air volume isn't actually specified. It might vary slightly to ensure that exactly 20,000 CFM of air will be supplied. In any case, the mixed air condition at state three must be along the line connecting states one and two and we expect it to be much closer to the return air state point because the return represents 75% of the stream by volume and the outside air represents only about 25%. To locate state three, you can use a couple different methods. You can find the enthalpy at state one and two, 
then calculate the weighted average by volume flow rate. Or what I did here, since the math was fairly easy, since state one is 90 degrees and state two is 80 degrees and 75% of the air is return, you can reason that the mixed air is going to be 82 and a half degrees. It's a quarter of the way up the line, but closer to state two, right? Closer to the return air because there's more return air. Hopefully you find that intuitive. Then you can follow the line of constant enthalpy or constant wet bulb since they're pretty much parallel and you get 32.8 BTU per pound as the enthalpy for state three. Then we can draw a line from state three, which is the air entering the coil, to state four in blue, which is the air leaving the coil. State four is located based on the leaving coil conditions, 58 dry bulb and 56 wet bulb. As expected, it's down and to the left for latent cooling and sensible cooling, respectively. You can then read off the enthalpy at state four, which is 23.8 BTU per pound. To find the refrigeration load, we're interested in the difference in enthalpy across the coil. So that's delta H, which equals H3 minus H4 for the way these have been labeled here. And plugging the numbers in, there's a difference of nine BTU per pound between those two states. So nine BTU per pound across the coil. So to calculate the refrigeration load, we can use the rule of thumb Q equals four and a half times CFM times delta H. Plugging in the 20,000 CFM for the volume and our delta H of nine, we get 810,000 BTU per hour, which we can divide by 12,000 BTU per hour per ton to get the answer in tons. Crossing out the units, we get 67 and a half tons. And that is the answer. But since many of you are worried about when you can and can't use rules of thumb, Let's also show a formal solution where we use Q equals M dot delta H, where the mass flow rate can be written as density times volume flow rate, which can be written as volume flow rate over specific volume times delta H, since specific volume is the inverse of the density. Then we can plug in the CFM and the delta H just as before, but we need to get the specific volume from the psych chart. A common question I'm often asked is, should you pick the specific volume for air entering the coil or leaving the coil? The answer is you should take the specific volume for wherever you know the volume. In this case, we know the supply volume is 20,000 CFM for certain. So I'm taking the specific volume from state four, which is the supply air. But in actuality, unless you're dealing with an extreme case for most typical air conditioning applications, your answer will be fairly close since the specific volume does not change dramatically. Anyway, we also need to convert from minutes to hours, so don't forget to multiply by 60. And that's why we always show the units so that you can see them cancel out and we don't make a silly mistake. And as you can see, we get 815,000 BTUs per hour, which is quite close. After converting to tons, that works out to 67.9 tons. And if you're wondering, what are the underlying assumptions behind that rule of thumb? Basically, the four and a half includes 60 minutes per hour and an assumed specific volume, which you can work backwards and calculate, turns out to be 13.33 cubic feet per pound. So that explains why there was a slight difference since when we looked it up, it was 13.25 in the formal solution. The size of the error will be a direct result of the difference in the specific volume. All right, guys, hope you enjoyed this problem. If you're a mechanical engineer studying for the PE exam and you would like to submit a question, the best way to do that is to send me an email, dan at mechanicalpeexamprep.com. And if you want to make your study process as efficient as possible, sign up for my courses if you haven't already. Use the link below and coupon code MEC10 to get 10% off. Until next week, happy studying.